Well, we should get started in a few minutes. Let's wait for a couple more minutes. Uh, Dr. Kawaja, I think you are muted. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I'm on now, right? Yeah. OK, and you can see the screen also, right? Yes. OK, wonderful. All right, we'll wait for one more minute and then we'll get started. Well, good morning. Um, as you all know, I'm Imran Khawaja with the section of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. And uh, we normally give this lecture on a yearly basis. I think this year it may be more relevant because of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, how the frontline people have worked tirelessly. And uh, I think it's very important to understand uh, fatigue and how to manage that. We will be starting with uh, our objectives today. The we'll talk about fatigue and sleep and how they are interrelated with each other. I'll go over some of the causes of fatigue because uh, unless unless we do not address uh, the causes of fatigue, we cannot go to the alert management strategies because all those strategies are based on the cause of the fatigue. We'll also talk about the recognition of sleepiness among residents. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the strategies we can use to mit mitigate sleep. In any organization that works 24-7, the fatigue and sleep are inevitable. And uh, the only thing we can do is try to mitigate that. And there are strategies that have been scientifically proved, which we'll talk about today in the lecture about how to solve that problem. The ACGME requires um, to educate all family members and residents to recognize the signs of fatigue and sleep deprivation. It also requires us to educate all family members and residents in alert measurement and fatigue mitigation processes, and uh, also to avoid any negative potential side effects from fatigue on patient care and learning. Is everybody following my slides, please? Is everybody looking at my slides? Emro, can you see it? Yes. 
Yes, we can see the slides, Dr. Kawaja. Okay. Thank you. So let's talk about uh, what is sleep and fatigue. They are interrelated with each other, and these are the definitions of fatigue and sleep. Fatigue actually is a subjective feeling of tiredness that is experienced physically and mentally. It ranges from tiredness to exhaustion, creating an unrelenting overall condition that interferes with individual's physical and cognitive ability to function to their normal capacity. Sleep, on the other hand, is a natural state of rest in which your eyes are closed, your body is inactive, and your mind does not think. So the issue here is that uh, the fatigue and sleep are related to each other. If somebody is fatigued, the only way to relieve somebody from their fatigue is to sleep. And an average person needs about seven and a half to eight hours of sleep to get refreshed. And uh, prevention of sleep deprivation in among residents actually is the most important way to reduce fatigue risk to patients and resident safety. And this has been published in multiple articles uh, repeatedly that the best way to relieve fatigue is sleep and avoid sleep deprivation. Now, I think it is unfair to say that all responsibility lies on the residents to combat against uh, fatigue and sleepiness. Supervisors, medical directors, they're also accountable for ensuring practices that are in place that enable and protect every trainee's ability to fulfill their role in the management of fatigue risk. Trainees, on the other hand, also have a key role in managing and reporting their own fatigue to their supervisors, peers, and to the healthcare team. I think those days are gone where it used to be felt as a stigma where um, if I report my sleepiness, I'm no good or somebody will look down upon me. It's uh, evolved over the past 50 years. It has evolved as a natural human ability to perform at their optimal levels and fatigue management has become a cornerstone in the uh, in this issue. So. I think the one of the key messages I would like to tell the residents is if you're tired, please speak out, tell your supervisors, tell your program directors uh, so that they can they know about it and they can make policies that uh, will help uh, protect every trainee and uh, help them perform to their maximum ability. Now let's talk about the what are the causes of fatigue and it's very important to understand that because um, if we don't understand what makes us fatigued, we may not be able to mitigate it. And uh, there are four main causes of fatigue. One is obviously the physical and under the physical, if we are acting against our circadian rhythm, uh, we will be falling victim of our own uh, uh, rhythm and that will act against us and will not help us sleep. The second important thing is the amount and quality of sleep, and we'll talk about those in detail. Also, physically, the shift length and the rotation, how often we get uh, night floor rotation or overnight rotations, and how do we countermeasures those uh, sleepy hours? Are we being careless in terms of whether we are using caffeine at inappropriate times or we are taking naps at inappropriate times? So those things do make a difference if we are doing the proper things, but at the wrong time, that is not going to help. Second big uh, uh, aspect is the emotional uh, and stress happens to be, which can be of any form, we'll talk about it. Social and cultural norms and psychological factors, um, all those issues can cause fatigue. So let's take them one by one. Let's start with the circadian rhythm. What is it? It is actually a behavioral physical and mental conditioning cycle that follows the near 24 hour biological clock, which uses natural cues such as the daylight to make us feel awake during the day and sleepy at nighttime. And I'll show you a graph in a minute. So acting against the circadian system, all of us have felt if we travel across uh, zones, uh, we feel jet lagged. And uh, especially when you're traveling from west to east, you will have more of a jet lag rather than coming from east to west. 
the effect of the fatigue are more apparent when working in the later half of the night because that's the time when um, uh, we are supposed to be sleeping and if you're awake we are actually getting ourselves into a state of sleep deprivation and our body fights that natural instinct to sleep when we are lowest in our circadian rhythm this is actually um, a nice uh, cartoon to indicate what is really happening and what induces the sleep and wakefulness. There are two main processes going on in our body. The process C, which is the circadian rhythm, actually drives the wakefulness. It is strongest in the early morning and weakest in the late afternoon. And this is the process that is driven through suprachiasmatic nucleus. So if you look at the circadian process, somewhere in about uh, 10 or 11 o'clock, um, we go to sleep wake up at uh, seven o'clock and then uh, our circadian rhythm keeps on bumping up and then it starts coming down. On the other hand, the process S is adenosine mediated process. When we wake up in the morning, the levels of adenosine are at their lowest level. The adenosine tends to build up as the day progresses till we get to the point where uh, we are at uh, 10 or 11 o'clock uh, at night time where the two processes meet. So if you look at it, the, the downward arrows are the homeostatic process, which is adenosine mediated. On the other hand, the circadian drive is the our wakefulness drive, and that keeps on going up till we get to the point of about 10 or 11 o'clock at night time, where the two processes meet. And when the sleep is induced, your adenosine level start going backwards, and your circadian, which is the wakefulness uh, cycle, is at its lowest. Now imagine if you start being awake at this point, uh, which is obviously if you are working at night time or night float or being a overall night resident, you are fighting your own circadian rhythm, and that is unnatural. And that's where the next morning when you will wake up, you will still have very high adenosine levels. And at eight o'clock when the morning rounds come in, you'll be very sleepy. You you will have. Um, little surge in your in your wakeful circadian rhythm but then adenosine levels are so high that um, you will fall asleep and this this point may be up here at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night time if you're awake all night long so that's very important to understand what are our physiologic determinants of sleep and how these processes work we cannot fight sleep but it is possible to alter that or to adapt. And uh, and we'll talk about those when we talk about the strategies. The second aspect is the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep. Um, it has been shown multiple times that after 24 to 30 hours of sleep deprivation, an individual's cognitive performance goes down from fifth percentile to 15th percentile. However, in the case of the physicians, that drop may be down to seventh percentile of their performance um, compared to when they are rested. So we as physicians actually experience more decline in cognitive performance than even general population, uh, probably because there is more brain tasking procedures or um, issues that we have to deal with that require more of the mental um, capability. And uh, if you're tired, your performance drops very low. This was a study done by Van Dongen in 2003, and they looked at the attention lapses and the poor performance. Uh, you can see that if somebody is sleeping eight hours in bed, they have almost no attention lapses. If you sleep six hours, which is a partial sleep loss, you start having some attention lapses and poor performance. But if you are only four hours, you are in the dangerous zone. And if you have not slept at all for 24 hours, your performance uh, is going to be very poor with a lot of attention lapses. You know, the, the, any discrepancy actually between the amount of sleep that is needed by an individual and the amount of sleep actually obtained, even for one night, it tends to build up a sleep debt. And we all incur that debt during the weekdays our, we tend to pay it off over the weekends. Normally it is considered that you need an average of seven hours of sleep to start a, a, to um, uh, 
to uh, relieve your sleep debt. But if you're not getting seven hours of sleep during the weekdays, we tend to incur a sleep debt and that must be paid off whether you take a weekend off or uh, sleep longer. The second important thing actually is the quality of sleep. So it doesn't matter you sleep seven hours or eight hours, but how well do you sleep? And to give you an example, uh, our sleep apnea patients, for example, they're very sleepy. They will sleep eight or nine hours, but they don't wake up fresh. They feel tired, exhausted, excessively sleepy during the daytime. And it is not that they have a lack of sleep. It is the quality of sleep that they, uh, they have. So back in 1800s, when the residency thing started, the residents used to stay in the, in the, um, in the hospital and uh, they were actually discouraged from getting married or have other family responsibilities uh, so that they could get a quality of sleep in the hospital. But those days are gone. Today, the residents live outside the hospital. Many of these are young physicians, they have families, they become new parents. And, uh, and as new parents, the babies, they wake up multiple times. And uh, so the, the new mothers and fathers are often interrupted and curtailed by the newborns, and that results in daytime fatigue. And that's a real fact. Um, the residents may be getting seven, eight hours of sleep, but if it is interrupted multiple times, that is not a good quality of sleep. So this actually study was done where this is a sleep hypnogram. Um, in normal patients, we go from the awake, we, we go down to our stage one, stage two, three, four, and then we, had, we transition back into the REM stage of the sleep. And as the night goes through, you're, you're getting more and more REM stage of the sleep. And most of us actually towards the early morning will wake up from a REM stage of the sleep. Guess what happens if you're on call and uh, you're being interrupted multiple times uh, by your pager, uh, your sleep will be very fragmented. And this fragmentation in sleep actually is something similar to what we see in people with sleep apnea, for example, where they are being woken up multiple times, their sleep is highly fragmented, they get less of the REM or slow wave state sleep, and that leads to excessive daytime sleepiness. Third thing that uh, also impacts as the cause of fatigue is the shift and the length rotation. Long or extended shifts reduce the opportunity to sleep. And there's some evidence actually that uh, the traditional overnight call schedules which, which we used to have, where we would be up for 24 hours or 36 hours. And even if that shift is once a week, it actually causes more fatigue than in night float rotation. That's why there's more new concept of night float rotators, um, where if you do a nine hour, 12 hour shift or five consecutive nights and you get two nights of rest, that is more refreshing and more adaptable compared to if you are on shift for 24 to 36 hours in a row. And I'll show you the data that indicates that if you are awake for 24 or 36 hours, it may take two to three days before you can get that to baseline. And then your next call comes in and then you are again more fatigued and tired for the next two or three days. So the some of the latest literature does recommend night float rotations um, as a better way to combat against uh, excessive sleepiness in that situation. Also, a rapidly rotating schedules, they also reduce the opportunity to catch up on the sleep and thereby increasing the ch chance of fatigue. Now, that's not a big issue in, in residency, but in other jobs where uh, people may be changing their uh, schedules from morning to night and afternoon, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, causes more fatigue and sleepiness compared to if you were to change your rotating schedule on a week to week basis, and it goes from uh, in the advancing format, for example, 8 to 3, 3 to 11, uh, one week, and then the third week will be 11 to 7. Um, that is much better rotating schedule than you, if you're on a call one night and then next day you're off and the third day you're on 8 to 3 o'clock. So that does not work either because uh, it does not give your body enough time to uh, adapt to the new schedule. So this was a study actually that was published in 2001 and they looked at the surgical residents and their laparoscopic uh, cases and uh, they found out that the residents had more errors, surgical errors after an uh, overnight call uh, compared to before the overnight call. 
and that's understandable because they were busy there uh, they were awake for 24 hours and then you put them to a surgical task and uh, the number of surgical errors go up this was in the study published in 1999 in American Journal of Physiology, and they looked at the psychomotor vigilance. And uh, I just want you guys to look at this graph and the elapsed time while they have been awake, and this is the reaction time. So after about 16 hour, or 18 hours of, um, of uh, being awake, people start developing poor performance and their reaction time goes up. So if you, the more you're up then, the higher will be your uh, um, reaction time in terms of milliseconds. So your time to response will go up. That indicates that there is a poor psychomotor vigilance performance. Now, as I said earlier, if you're doing a rotating shift, it may take two to three days before you can recuperate. And this was uh, shown in this uh, study published in the sleep in 1997 where they took uh, individuals, had them um, sleep seven, seven and a half hours for the first two nights, and then they sleep deprived these people for about five hours for the next uh, seven days. And then they let them recuperate for eight hours of sleep. And even after one night of sleep, they were barely down to where they were on, on the day two. So they concluded that it may take another two or three days before they can get back to their baseline See, the, the y-axis here is the performance vigilance ta task lapses. So even after one night of sleep, they were still having more lapses in their performance, and it took them another one or two more days before they could get back to their baseline. And that's why it is just being on one call one night and being rotating every third or fourth night, you may not get back to your baseline to be able to perform well. And this was shown, um, they, they did the MSLT studies in these people that objectively showed that these people were excessively sleepy during the daytime after uh, they were sleep deprived for five hours per week. And uh, they had more performance deficits after day seven. And the full recovery really took at least two full nights of sleep of eight hours. Fourth uh, cause of fatigue is the careless use of countermeasures and the two things that we commonly employ in uh, uh, fatigue management is the use of the caffeine and, the, and taking naps. However, if you don't use them strategically, uh, they can be counterproductive. For example, if you're using caffeine towards the end of the work shift, you will reduce your ability to sleep after work. Same way, if you are taking longer naps, for example, you can develop a condition called sleep inertia. So when you wake up uh, because you are getting into more deeper stages of the sleep, it is more of a problem in younger physicians because they have more propensity to go into the third stage of the sleep, which is their deeper stage of the sleep. And when you wake up from that, you will develop a sleep inertia. And we'll talk about that. And so a short nap may be more productive than a longer nap. And this is what a sleep inertia or sleep drunkenness is. Uh, what it means is that, uh, again, as I talked about earlier, you have the circadian clock and the homeostatic sleep drive. Both of them, they drive. And once you get into the deeper stages of the sleep, and if you are asked to be woken up from that deep sleep, people will not remember what they talked about. To give you an example, say, for example, you're on call, and uh, you get uh, a page, you pick up the phone, you talk to the nurse. You may be making very relevant um, um, uh, conversation with the, with the nurse, but the next day you may not actually remember anything. Um, and the more fatigued and tired you are, the longer the sleep inertia may be. It's worse than performance after 26 hours of sleep deprivation. Normally it can last up to 10 minutes, but it has lasted even up to two hours. And um, all that is how much prior sleep deprivation did you have? And as the moment you go into the sleep after 20, 30 minutes, you're getting into the stage three or REM stage of the sleep, you're woken up from that sleep, you feel like you're sleep drunk and you may make a full conversation, but the next day you may not even remember what, uh, what was talked about. Next uh, big uh, aspect is the emotional aspect that does lead to fatigue. 
So Dr. Sally, back in uh, 1965, actually defined and coined a term called the stress syndrome. And it postulated that the body responds to stress of any kind, whether it's an illness or any other physical type of a stress with a unified defense mechanism, which is characterized by specific structural and chemical changes. And I don't have time, but all of you know how our cortisol levels work in the body, how they're affected by, by the uh, even circadian rhythm uh, or the stresses and, and so forth and so forth. Um, stress syndrome is actually very common among graduate physicians and stress and fatigue are actually reciprocal as both can cause or can be a consequence of the other. So one thing feeds into the other. You're stressed, you may be fatigued, you're fatigued, you're stressed. And uh, the stress actually then can cause the sleep loss and then sleep loss can lead to fatigued physicians. So the three things that are going in conjunction with each other is stress, fatigue and sleep. And they are all three interrelated. We sometimes don't realize how stressed we are but the damage it is causing to our body, both structurally and chemically inside, we are unaware of that. And uh, there's tons of literature now addressing the stress issues and the emotional issues and causing the fatigue and uh, excessive sleepiness. Social and cultural consequences as are another big one as the cause of the uh, fatigue. And I talked a little bit about young physicians um, having multiple awakenings at nighttime, have other family responsibilities. So that's not the only issue. The only issue, uh, the other issue is that if you are fatigued, people tend to develop behavioral changes that can negatively affect your personality, your social relationships, as well as the relationship with the coworkers. And then that can reflect on the patient care. And uh, you just don't uh, feel like, um, um, I don't care anymore, or you know, the lack of empathy. All those things um, uh, will make physicians more impatient, agitated, increased irritability, and they will have a difficult time getting along with others. Psychological consequences, and actually we are hearing more and more about these in the past uh, year or so uh, with the COVID. The fatigued individuals actually have a reduced ability to recognize specific emotions and report a lower levels of empathy than well-rested individuals. This puts a strain not only on social relationships, but then also alter the way a physician interacts with their coworkers and their patients. The cognitive impairments that a fatigued individual can be compared to a blood alcohol level that is over the legal limit to drive after 24 hours sustained wakefulness. So if the legal limit is 0 0.05, they, uh, and there's a study that was done in 2003, they compared the cognitive impairment to somebody who was legally drunk if you deprive them for 24 hours of sleep and they may behave as if they are legally drunk. Whether I will let somebody drive in that situation, I think the answer is no. So so fatigue is, is, uh, is, is uh, causing a lot of physical and mental impairment, whether we re realize that or not. And as a matter of fact, this was a study that was published uh, last year. It was a study out of China, and they looked at the first line workers and people who were taking care of uh, uh, COVID-19. And I was actually surprised myself to look at these numbers. They, they looked at 2,600 patients um, who were frontline workers and two months after the COVID-19 pandemic outbroke in China. And 23% of these people were anxious, 50% were depressed and fatigue was almost in 74% of the patients who are fatigued. And I'm sure uh, most of us who have dealt with uh, COVID in the past year and even now, uh, the amount of work uh, that has uh, been there, uh, we all feel the same way. Um, at least fatigue is, is there. Uh, and there is a positive correlation between this fatigue, depression, and anxiety in the frontline workers during this pandemic. Excessive fatigue then can lead to negative emotions and promote depression. And same thing again, you know, you're fatigued, you're tired, you feel like you just don't care, you wanna go home, you wanna rest, you're sleepy, your, uh, your vigilance has gone down, um, and the reaction time has gone up. So 
all those things then feed into each other. And this was, I thought, a nice study to look at uh, some of the psychological impact that COVID-19 has uh, done to the frontline workers. So in summary, the a sleep deprived resident has multiple consequences. It uh, not only causes the patient care professionalism cause inability to learn, it also impacts their health and well-being, family relationships, mood and performance, troubles at the workplace, and finally, the driving safety, driving back home. And I showed you the study where they looked at 24 hours sleep deprivation and uh, as if they were legally drunk. So uh, I think we need to address all these issues. Um, so now that we have talked about the causes of fatigue, let's see how do we recognize sleepiness in ourselves and among the residents because there is a myth and not only that, it is underestimated. And the self-assessment of fatigue on performance is often underestimated than the true impairments. Furthermore, as the fatigue becomes a chronic pattern during residency training, the ability to assess the degree of sleep-related impairment goes down and many incorrectly come to the conclusion that they have acclimated or adapted to the deprived sleep state and they are not sleepy anymore. So the two things that are important are the perception versus reality, both sleep deprivation and sleep restriction. So sleep deprivation, if you are uh, uh, deprived of sleep and sleep restriction, where will be, for example, interrupted sleep, contribute towards sleepiness and alertness at any given time of the day. Now, subjectively, um, if you ask uh, people, their perception of sleepiness uh, is much less reliable than objective measures. For example, if we were to bring to sleep lab and we were to do the MSLT study, which is an objective way of measuring how sleepy they are and, and having them subjectively say, uh, uh, give us their scale on an effort sleepiness scale, there will be a discordance between the two. They may score much less on the effort sleepiness scale but on the MSLT study will be severely abnormal, indicating that they are very sleepy. So this mismatch that develops because their perception is that they're not sleepy, but in reality that they are sleepy leads to a very dangerous condition, which is called the micro sleep. And this is very important in um, uh, especially surgical residents where if they are uh, driving or operating uh, in the OR after 24 hours call and they go into this uh, unintentional episodes of sleep which really typically lasts only between 5 to 14 seconds in duration and is called as the micro sleep and um, they may be nodding their head drooping their eyelids they may be unaware or spacing out or have delayed actions and how important it is while they are operating the next day also if um, and they're driving, the residents are driving back home. Uh, they can get into this micro sleep, which can last only five to 14 seconds, and an accident can happen in that time very quickly, um, not realizing that uh, they are that sleepy. So, how do we indicate somebody is fatigued? And there are three main uh, aspects the physical, the mental, and the emotional or psychological. So, among the physical signs, and the resident may be yawning during the rounds. They may have drooping eyelids. They may be rubbing their eyes, involuntary nodding of the head, involuntary naps and micro sleep that we talked about, poor or reduced motor skills and increased susceptibility to illness. They may be having running nose, upper respiratory tract infections, those type of things, uh, um, uncontrolled blood pressure, uh, poor diabetes control if they have diabetes. So those could be some of the physical signs that might indicate that fatigue is a major play. Mental signs include reduced attention span, decreased alertness, poor judgment, poor communication, near miss or call, close call, keep on checking your work over and over again. And then the emotional and psychological aspect is irritability, poor temperament, quiet, withdrawn, unmotivated, sluggish, lethargic, giddiness. So if you see those signs, um, a lot of that could be because of the, they're being fatigued. So this was the study actually done. They looked at the effort sleepiness scale among the uh, and the how sleepy they are. 
And if you look at it, uh, effort sleepiness score for those who don't know what it is, it's a subjective way of looking at how sleepy somebody is. There are eight questions. Each question has uh, uh, scales from zero to three. Zero is that they are not tired or sleepy. One is they have a slight chance of dozing off. Two is moderate. Three is a high chance of dozing off. And then these are the eight aspects, sitting and reading, watching television, sitting inactive in a public place, laying down to rest in the afternoon, if the circumstances permit, sitting and talking to someone, sitting uh, quietly after lunch without an alcohol, sitting as, as a passenger in a car for an hour without a break, or in the car while stopping the traffic for a few minutes. And then patients, they rate their sleepiness based on these eight questions. So there's a total of uh, 24 points that you can give to the patients. And generally it is considered somebody who's scoring less than 10 is generally not sleepy. And normal people will score somewhere about five or six. Uh, people with insomnia obviously will score much less. And generally in our clinical population with sleep apnea, we use this scale very commonly almost on every patient. They will score somewhere between 12, 14, 15 in that range. Compared to people who have narcolepsy, which is uh, uh, excessive sleepiness, um, they will score somewhere as high as 18 or 20. And long behold, look at the residents. They are scoring in between somebody who has a sleep apnea or who has narcolepsy, and they will average score at 15. And this actually scale may be again under representative of what they are actually sleepy. Because if I were to do MSRT study on these patients, they might be in that narcolepsy range rather than being uh, on the lower scale. So their mean sleep onset latency on the MSRT may be less than eight minutes. They may be getting into the REM stages of the sleep. So a chronic sleep deprivation even subjectively causes excessive sleepiness than even in patients who have sleep apnea. And uh, objectively, they may score as high as somebody who may be narcoleptic. So <laughs> over a seven day period, there are a few things you can look at that will categorize somebody as being a low risk, significant risk or a higher risk. So for example, if somebody is working less than 50 hours uh, will be at a lower risk, somebody working 50 to 70 hours will be in a significant risk and more than 70 hours a week will be a higher risk. Um, the same way if they're not working more than 10 consecutive hours will be lower, 14 hours will be moderate and 14 or more hours will be in the higher risk. If they take uh, three or more short breaks during the daytime while they're working, they will be lower risk. If they take only one or two breaks, they will be in moderate and uh, higher risk will be if they don't take any breaks. And same way you can look through that. Um, people are not working night work. They are at a very significantly low risk. But if somebody is working two nights of uh, a week uh, uh, or extended hours, they will be at a moderate risk. But if they're working three nights of the week, uh, they will be at a much higher risk of having daytime fatigue and symptoms. So people who have, uh, again, if they have to work the shift work, if they're not given any, um, if their work schedule changes, uh, without uh, any notice or anything, or they are not, you know, changed, they have low risk. If there are changes to the work schedule through additional hours and calls out work load, that's significant risk. But if their work schedule changes so much as we talked about earlier, they are at much higher risk of having fatigue risk. So just a common sense, less hours work, more short breaks during the daytime, less night work or no night work, puts you at a much lower risk of having fatigue during the daytime compared to somebody who is uh, making those changes uh, very quickly. Now let's talk to the fun part, which is the alertness management strategies. And among those are the operational strategies and the personal strategies. The operational strategies actually are implemented by the program director and the hospital and the residency program team. So they work on those and those uh, have included over the years, the limitation of the resident work hours, projected time for sleep, and the rotation schedule designs based on chronobiological principles like the we talked about the circadian rhythm. So I'm not going to talk about those operational strategies in this talk because what I'm going to talk about is what we can do at an individual level that will promote awareness around the risk of fatigue for both the residents as well as supervisors. And the point I'm going to make here really is that not only 
it's the responsibility of the residents, but also the supervisors. Say, for example, if I'm in, in attending in the ICU, it is as much as, much as my responsibility also to let, let to look at the well-being of that particular resident who may be up all night long, be sleepy, he may not be saying anything, but just by looking at some of the signs and symptoms we talked about earlier, it may be very easy to identify that this particular resident most likely sleep deprived and fatigue, and I think that may be time for him to take some uh, rest. So it's very important uh, for us uh, who are supervising the residents also to pay attention to the residents' uh, fatigue and tiredness. They work relentlessly, they work all night long, they may have eight or 10 admissions overnight, and the next morning they may be uh, tired and sleepy and without, uh, and they may not say anything, but I think it's part of our job is to recognize um, their fatigue and sleepiness. So the conceptual framework to address this excessive daytime sleepiness in the residency years revolves around a few things. We, we need to take into account circadian rhythm disruption, and that's very, very important because all of us have an internal cycle and we cannot fight that sleep. So we have to work around that circadian rhythm by adjusting our night shifts, night floats, those type of things. We need to address how we can um, provide sufficient sleep even while they are on call. Um, and we can talk about those, for example, having um, giving up their pager to the senior resident, getting one or two hours of nap in between. So those type of things that I think the, the program directors can implement how we can um, eliminate the fragmented sleep, for example, the pagers and the phone calls. And don't forget, we are all humans. We can also suffer from other uh, sleep related problems like sleep apnea, even insomnia. If somebody has insomnia problem, you give them even seven, eight hours of sleep and they're unable to sleep during that period of time. Uh, they will be sleep deprived and uh, they will be more fatigued. So addressing their primary sleep disorders is as important as taking care of and their circadian rhythm, insufficient sleep, fragmented sleep, long continuous shifts, or the reduced opportunities for sleep, or minimum time for recuperation. So, as I said earlier, um, in any 24-7 um, organization, um, we, we can't eliminate uh, the fatigue, but we can adapt, and we can adapt by developing healthy, conscious, approach to fatigue management. We need to discuss about our natural body responses, which are the circadian rhythms and the sleep science, and factors that promote, promote a healthy pattern of wakefulness and good sleep hygiene. And then that is important also in terms of occupational health and safety, individual and team level, implications of fatigue for both the residents and the patient safety. And an example will be higher risk of having needle stakes, motor vehicle accidents, those type of things, which I think need to be talked about um, so that uh, the residents are aware that um, lack of performance can lead to injuries to not only themselves, but to the others also. I think few myths that we need to really wash off is, um, you know, saying in the, like, I know when I'm too tired to perform or I will adapt to less sleep. I just need a cup of coffee of a Red Bull to work perform fully. My program director will look down on me if I complain about being tired and a nap will only make it worse. And the more I work, the smarter I get. These are all myths. And uh, the only reason I put them up is because these concepts need to go away. None of them is true. Now, the higher risk time for our fatigue is from midnight to 6 a.m. And I showed you the circadian cycle where in the midnight, we, uh, we, our circadian is at its nadir, where, which means that our system is trying to make us sleepy while we are trying to stay awake and fight it. Same way, early hours of the day shift, first night call or night call after break, change of service, the first two to three hours of a shift or end of the shift, early in the residency or when new to the night call and transition from PG-11 to PG-2 with increased duty hours. So those are some of the high risk times that you need to be aware of when you may be more prone to fatigue and sleepiness. Now let's talk about the alertness management strategies and uh, some of the personal strategies that we can implement can be adequate sleep. We'll talk about it. Some of the sleep strategies like anchor lay, sleep, split sleep, periods, 
planned napping, and then the judicious use of caffeine, use of regular exercise, and exposure to light on and off the job. So the first thing we can always, if you're on a night call, is to avoid starting out with the sleep deficit. So if you're already sleep deprived uh, the, and you are coming to work, you are going to be fatigued and tired as compared to somebody who has taken seven hours of sleep for at least a couple of nights before you come on a call rotation. Um, even during the light or no call rotations, residents do not obtain adequate sleep. This has been well shown in studies. Chronic loss of sleep has also been shown to have adverse effect on metabolic and endocrine function, and we talked about that stress and the psychophysiological uh, aspect. And so therefore, it is important to get an adequate amount of sleep of at least seven to nine hours for several days, at least two days prior to anticipated sleep loss, which is, means if you're on call at night time. So the study actually, they looked at uh, the performance and um, uh, what was shown that um, in the, these residents who are well rested, their satisfaction with their learning increased. That's in the, um, uh, in the red, zone, uh, red line here. Their satisfaction with the time with the attending physicians increased, which is the green line here. And their uh, satisfaction with the quality of time with the attendings also increased, which is in the yellow or orange line. And working without adequate supervision actually went down. So if, and this is dependent on how many hours of sleep did they get. So a resident who is getting an average of seven to eight hours of sleep had more satisfaction during the working hours and less reliance on uh, adequate supervision. All right. Now, this was a study that was done in 2003, and they looked at, again, uh, how long does it take um, for um, people to rec recuperate if they are partially sleep deprived? And if you look at it, if somebody is sleeping nine hours, they have no lapses or no uh, performance um, uh, lapses. But if they are sleeping five hours. We don't see uh, these slides, Dr. Kawaja. Uh, slides are stuck? Yeah, I don't see them. Oh, somebody made some changes here. Let me see. Do you hear now? Do you see now? No, I don't. I'm not sure uh, about others. Yeah, somebody went. Uh, hold on, let me call. OK. Just uh, court is coming in, I think. Uh, Please come. Just one second. No. Can you see now? No. No. Um, exit slide and go back to it. Share. Let's share it again. Where is that sharing thing? It's on that that little arrow over here next to the end button. This one? No. Oh, this one? Yes. Yeah, this one? No, go over. See the league button? Uh -huh. The little, okay. that one right there. You can see it now. You can see it now? Yeah. Okay, very good. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah okay, very good. Thank you. So bottom line is uh, that um, increasing sleep time improves the learning during the residency years. And it takes about at least, again, the study was showing at least three nights of, um, of full sleep before we can recover back to our baseline functions. Let's talk about a little bit about napping. And uh, this study was done, actually, there are multiple studies, but the one that was done in 2001 does indicate that uh, it temporarily improves alertness. 
short nap should no longer be more than 30 minutes to avoid that sleep energy we talked about and taking advantage of the circadian window, window of opportunity, which is typically between two to five o'clock in the morning or two to five in the evening is the time when you should be napping. But again, please remember no longer than 30 minutes of nap because uh, after that you can get into your slow wave stage sleep or the REM stage of the sleep and that can cause more sleep inertia. So if you wake up after that, you may be feeling very uh, tired and fatigued and groggy for the next couple of hours. Some sleep is always better than no sleep. The only issue here is what time and for how long do you sleep are the key to getting the most out of the napping. So, and that's where you may want to take it, uh, advantage of your circadian rhythm. Uh, try to take a nap between two to five o'clock in the morning for 30 minutes or in the late afternoon, like Britishers do. They will take a 30 minutes nap after lunch. I think th those are the best times uh, we can take a short nap and that can refresh you for the rest of the evening. The two concepts of the napping strategies include a prophylactic nap and a therapeutic nap. A prophylactic nap actually is a brief nap that you take 24 hours of the sleep loss. It has been shown to improve alertness during the 24 hours of sustained wakefulness and similar effectiveness to repeated 15 milligram boluses of caffeine. So in a prophylactic nap um, is actually equivalent to a, a dose of caffeine. Um, and I tend to recommend uh, also that to my patients who may have narcolepsy, a 30 minutes or 20 minutes of nap actually may be almost as effective as uh, a dose of Ritalin. So, uh, and that can work in, in residency years also where um, a short nap uh, can be very helpful. Uh, therapeutic nap actually is um, frequent naps. They're also brief, no more than 15 to 30 minutes. And that is during the uh, night floor. And you take that 15 minutes nap every two to three hours while you are uh, doing the night float. Let's talk about the caffeine and uh, a nice article published in 2005 looked at the stimulants, mostly caffeine, and they also looked at the methylphenidate and other aspects which we are not going to talk about. But caffeine is something that is being used uh, in almost any organization to combat against fatigue and sleepiness. The only kicker here is the strategic consumption. You have to consume it strategically. It's, uh, it starts uh, onset in about 15 to 30 minutes. Half-life is typically three to seven hours, more, more so around six hours. And it is uh, used for temporarily relief of sleepiness. The, the drawbacks to that are that we can develop tolerance. It can disrupt sleep if you take it, say, early in the morning, just before you're ready to go home. You can take a cup of coffee. You may not be able to sleep and uh, be ready for the next night, uh, night, uh, night float. And the other problem is the diuretic effect that can not only make you dehydrated, but also may make you pee during the time when you are trying to sleep and uh, multiple awakenings uh, to go to the bathroom may also happen. How, how does the caffeine effect is through your homeostatic process or the process as that we talked about earlier? It is an antagonist of adenosine. So what happens is the adenosine, as we wake up, we are at the lowest level of adenosine. And as the time passes, um, the adenosine tends to build up in our system. So when we take a caffeine, um, it tends to counterbalance against that high levels of adenosine and pushes the adenosine levels back and we feel more awake and refreshed. Um, and that's how it, um, it works. So some of the caffeine uh, use, um, as I said, you need to use it strategically. To try to avoid caffeine use when you are not tired, as this will increase caffeine tolerance without maximizing the caffeine effects. Avoid, uh, avoid caffeine intake several hours prior to the planned bedtime as a stimulant. It can be disruptive and actually it can shorten your slow wave, say sleep or stage three, and that you really need for your body to rest. And um, as the ca caffeine consumption produces a diuretic effect, make sure you're not taking it uh, very close to your sleep time anyways, and you should uh, drink plenty of liquids also. This is the caffeine content in various uh, products, and you can see that uh, Starbucks has uh, probably the highest amount of caffeine and of about 260 now milligrams. Now the, the amount of the caffeine is very individualized in, in somebody may be very sensitive to caffeine and may do well with just a, a simple tea while somebody may not uh, respond well to even a Starbucks chronic coffee. So it all depends on 
uh, what is your level of tolerance and defect, and it's highly variable from person to person. So not everybody has to drink Starbucks. I think just a cup of tea or uh, um, or a soft drink may, may, may suffice too. Physical activity is very important, but again, it has to be done in a strategic manner. Um, you engage in some physical activity in the last few hours of your shift. Um, you know, you can stand up frequently, stretch, walk around, go outside if, uh, if you can. And the daily exercises, um, uh, if you do some maximal aerobic exercises, that tends to relieve fatigue in the short term. Some maximal exercise will be where you are not getting your heart rate up to the 80-85% of the maximum predicted heart rate. And uh, physicians enrolled in the exercise programs report less work dependence fatigue symptoms. And general recommendations are take about 150 minutes of um, exercise uh, per week, or at least 30 minutes five times per week uh, is sufficient to meet that goal. Some of the other sleep uh, habits, healthy sleep habits include, um, you need to realize what your circadian rhythm is. Some people are night owls and some people are larks. So uh, they function better at nighttime. Some people function better during the daytime. Some people are early risers. So it is, uh, one shoe does not fit all, so you have to understand what your circadian rhythm will allow you to do the best under under your situation. Generally speaking, it's good uh, to go to the bed and get up at about the same time every day and not to change your schedule. Even on the weekends, try not to delay your sleep for no more than an hour or so. It is important if you develop a pre-sleep routine because that helps you go to sleep. For example, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, um, uh, things like that, um, or, or some listening to a little relaxing music, reading a book. Uh, they, they, if you develop a sleep routine, um, that will help you go to sleep quickly. And uh, the most important also thing is protect your sleep time and list your family and friends. Tell them this is time for me to go to sleep. Uh, I'll appreciate if nobody bothers me during these seven hours of sleep and try to get at least seven to nine hours of sleep before the anticipated sleep loss. Other healthy sleeping habits include um, keep your bedroom cooler and darker, keep it quiet, avoid going to bed hungry, but try not to eat heavy meals within three hours of going to sleep. Get a regular exercise, but avoid heavy exercise within three hours of sleep and avoid using alcohol to help you fall asleep because it can help induce the sleep. But as the alcohol metabolizes, it tends to disturb our sleep and uh, the later half of the night can be very disrupting. So not only that, those were the individual um, um, strategies. There are some team based fatigue mitigation strategies also. Uh, you need to communicate. That's the first and the foremost thing. Communicate your fatigue to your team. Uh, try to monitor your fatigue status in a, in a diary or a logbook. I think working in pairs or teams helps reallocate tasks in, that increase high team cross checking, increase supervision. You can use video conferencing or telemedicine based shift schedules on sleep uh, science. Uh, in other words, you can use uh, those type of things to help you um, with the um, um, uh, with your night uh, sign outs and those type of things. Seek second opinion on critical cl clinical conditions. Make sure you're not making any mistakes. Ensure fatigued individual avoid acting as primary operator in a procedure or work environment like surgery. You can schedule less complex works um, at the highest fatigue time, which I talked about earlier, two to five o'clock in the morning or two to five in the afternoon, if it is possible. Ensure fatigue individuals has the priority access to on-call rooms and napping facilities access to the taxi vouchers and going home if they're sleepy. All clinicians, educators and residents take responsibility for identifying and reporting unsafe conditions in accordance with professional standards and hospital policy without fear of reprisal. That's very, very important. And I think we need to understand that uh, it's, uh, we all get fatigued and tired. We all experience that. There's no shame on reporting that. All clinicians, educators and learners take responsibility for maintaining optimal personal health and well-being outside of work, including maintaining physical fitness, nutrition, and sleep. So in summary, the individual fatigue mitigation strategies, you have to perform a self-assessment prior to or during the shift work. Ensure adequate recovery time prior to each shift. A judicious use of the caffeine work break or work break with no pagers or phone. Napping will help. Little exercise will help. Ensure adequate hydration and nutrition. Double check your calculations and instructions. 
You can defer non-urgent cases if you can, if you're sleepy and tired. Limit overtime hours. Avoid repetitive or monotonous tasks during periods of higher fatigue risk. When possible, avoid highly complex tasks during periods of higher fatigue risk. Work in pairs or team. Employ self-assessment checklists and signs and symptoms of fatigue. And when necessary, stand down. Just say, I am tired, I cannot perform. So in summary, this last slide, uh, as we mentioned, fatigue is an impairment like alcohol or drugs. Drowsiness, sleepiness, and fatigue cannot be eliminated in residency, but they can be managed as we talked about. Recognition of sleepiness, fatigue, and use of alertness management strategies are simple ways to help combat sleepiness in residency. When sleepiness interferes with your performance or health, talk to your supervisors and program director. And when you see something, please say something. One size does not fit all. In other words, we talked about the circadian. If you're night owl or you're morning lark, you need to know which suits you the best. And I'm going to stop here. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, very good. I think it's nine o'clock, so I'll be leaving now.